ideas for bringing the garden indoors right after this. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about blurring the lines between inside and out. Now, I'm so excited today because we're talking about one of the rooms in the Garden Home Retreat that's actually coming very close to being finished. It's the mud room. Now, what's exciting to me about a room with not such a glamorous name is that it also serves as a place for me to work with cut flowers. So in today's show, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about blurring the lines between inside and out by showing you how to plant some things that you can use for flower arrangements inside, as well as go through some of the important elements that I use when I create floral designs. Why don't we get started with a tour of this space? This is actually a tiny room. You see, it's only 18 by 9 feet, and it's divided into two rooms, really. The mud room here and over to my right, well, that is the utility room or the laundry room. Now, what's great about this is that it's transforming very quickly. As a matter of fact, just last week, what you would have seen in here were lots of electrical wires, some plumbing, the bare studs, and the soybean insulation between the studs. Soon after that, they came in with V-groove pine siding laid on a horizontal that covered the walls and the ceiling. After that, they came in, put in the pine floor. You see, this is made up of six and eight inch boards. Now just take a look at this track and wheel system we have on the door here that divides the mud room from the laundry room. Pretty cool, huh? It's just like the ones we put on the barns. Now what's great about this is it allows you to make use of small space. You see, I don't have doors swinging in and out of these rooms. It's more efficient. Now I'm also very happy about this color. This color is called North Creek Brown. It looks like it's got some green in it, and what I like about it, it really serves as a dull neutral. For my flower arranging room, bringing in any color of foliage or bloom, it's going to work great against this neutral. Not only did I paint the walls this color, I also painted the ceiling as well as the cabinet. And it's a great contrasting color with the brick walls. Now, we're far from finished here. I still have light fixtures to go. We've got to deal with the floor as well as the appliances and my farm sink that'll be over there, which will come in very handy when we start arranging flowers. You know, I'm a hopeless collector when it comes to anything that has to do with the garden or allowing you to bring the garden inside. It's like these little brass spray nozzles. I've got a collection of these, and I think they make interesting decorative objects. The other thing I've been collecting over the years are all these floral frogs. You know, these days we lean on floral foams to do flower arrangements, but in the last century, well, it was devices like this, these frogs, and they're called frogs because they actually go under water in a container, and you can arrange flowers in them, and they just basically stabilize the stem so you can create an arrangement. And they come in all different shapes and sizes, and they're often heavy made of lead like this with spikes in them, and this will give stability to the arrangement. Now, they're not always metal. In fact, I've got quite a collection of these clear glass ones, which I think are very, very beautiful. Now, I have this ensemble set up with a painted shelf, which is the same color I've painted the walls, which is that North Creek Brown, sitting on top of an 1820s a uh, pine chest of drawers where I have all of my floral supplies tucked in here. So I still have my modern floral foam as well as tape and pipe cleaners and sticks and all that I need to create arrangements. It's very handy. You know, I love this little greenhouse. It allows me to get a head start on my spring planting. 
What I want to talk to you about are three flowers that I grow in my garden every year. And the reason I grow them is because they're great for flower arranging and they are so simple to grow. The first one, well, it's the sunflower. Now, one of my favorites is called Moulin Rouge. It has a gorgeous mahogany flower, and these will bloom throughout the entire summer into the fall. And what I do is I plant them about every six weeks, so I have a succession of bloom throughout the entire growing season. Now, another one you should try is Gumfrina. This is a plant that again, will bloom through the entire season, and it really does well both as a fresh, but also as a dried flower. It's very color fast, meaning that the dried flowers actually hold their color for a very long time. I've grown all colors, white, pale pink, and magenta, and all are great performers. Now, another flower that would fall in the everlasting category, which makes a great dried flower, is Seleucia. Now, one that I grew last year that I was knocked out by is one called Pompous Plume. Now, this plant will again bloom through the entire season, and it got up to four feet tall and covered itself with these marvelous little flame-like flowers. They're beautiful arranged with zinnias of all different colors, as well as the exuberant amaranth Polish spirit. Okay, let's talk about some starter plants, something that you might pick up at the garden center that will make great cut flowers. One I recommend is an angelonia. And a variety that's particularly good because of its strong stems is one called angel face blue. Now these are annuals that like full sun, and while it looks like larkspur, one advantage you'll see is the continuous bloom from early in summer till the first frost. Now if you've followed the show for any time now, you know I'm always happy to welcome a coneflower into the garden, be it the traditional purple coneflower or echinacea, or something newer like the white and orange varieties that are becoming so popular. The coneflower has long been prized, not only as a great garden flower, but also as a cut flower. In fact, during a visit to Holland, I saw how one grower was plucking the petals off and leaving just the cone to sell to the florist trade for fall arrangements. Now those are just a few examples of some great flowers you can use in arranging. But you know, if you're really into floral design, you know you can't dismiss or forget about foliage plants. So what I'd like to do is just mention a few foliage plants that I consider to be indispensable. One of the first that comes to mind is boxwood. It's basic, it's classic, it's been around for centuries, and I use it in so many different ways. One way is to help support daffodils in the spring. You see, boxwoods are a small leaf shrub that pair so well with flowers. Now another evergreen that's nice in arrangement, but has a more feathery foliage is arbovita, or the white cedars. Because these shrubs can grow to 30 to 40 feet tall, they're ideal as screens or windbreaks. Now here's an interesting fact. You see the word arborvitae in Latin means tree of life. Now I grow these in my front garden in the city, and they provide an excellent screen from the busy intersection. But I have to say, we're constantly pruning them to use them for flower arrangements. Now, branching out, if you will, let's talk about the broad-leafed evergreens. You might try the foliage from rhododendron or camellias. They're very interesting in arrangements. And I can't very well talk about broadleaf evergreens without including magnolias. And this one has become one of my favorites, particularly for cutting and bringing inside. This variety is called Little Gem. And what I love about it is the size of its leaf. Now, if you plant a little gem, you'll be glad to know that it's a much smaller version of the old Magnolia grandiflora, or southern magnolia, our native. You see, all magnolias prefer to grow in rich, acidic, and well-drained soil and need full sun or partial shade. Little gem is densely populated with lots of lustrous dark green leaves that are about four inches long and are covered with a bronzy brown color underneath. Just like the big magnolias expect fragrant blooms, and the good news here is that you can get blooms when these trees are still very young, sometimes in the tree's first year. Shrubs and trees can be some of the most expensive investments in our gardens. So let's take a look at some ways to keep ice and snow from damaging them. 
I've learned that tying up certain hedges and large shrubs, like this boxwood, can keep the snow from weighting down the plant's limbs. And knocking the snow off trees and shrubbery is a good idea. It will keep plants from bending and breaking. But don't try to knock the ice off your plants. Let the ice naturally melt to avoid damaging limbs and foliage. Over the years, I've learned that being prepared for old man winter's visits can save me a lot of time and worry. So here are some tips that may be helpful to you as you prepare your garden for the cold days ahead. Start by mulching your flower beds. You might be surprised how much protection a layer of mulch will provide your plants over the winter. Use bark, straw, pine needles, or leaves. I even use my old Christmas tree and garland. In my vegetable garden, I like using frost blankets like these to protect young plants. You can also keep winter vegetables growing longer by using a movable cold frame. To keep my tree roses from being damaged, I protect them from extreme temperatures by wrapping them with burlap cloth. These are just a few suggestions that you can put to use that will take the worry out of winter. You know, making greener decisions about the construction of this garden home retreat has been an important component to the whole construction process. Now, I just want to point out something. This is the western face of the house. Now, in this part of the world, in the summer, the heat can be so intense so we wanted to choose materials that would be very long lasting and could take the brutal intense heat that would come from the sun. So that's why we chose this particular clabbered. This is not wood, it's actually made of concrete. So it's going to be here for a long time and it takes paint beautifully. If you look over here at the columns, again, not wood. So you see traditionally these in this part of the world would have been made out of cypress planks. Instead, this is a man-made product with wood fiber, and there's no formaldehyde used in the process of making this. So you see, the idea here is to choose materials that are gonna be long-lasting. They don't have to be replaced or have to be maintained. I think you'll agree, flowers are certainly a way to connect with the people we care about. And with all this talk about flowers, you might be wondering how florists around the world get the beautiful blooms you've come to expect on a daily basis. Well, a great place to learn about the world's floral trade is here in Holland at the Alsmere Flower Market. If you walk into your florist any day of the year to pick up some flowers, it's very likely they may have come from this place. It's the largest flower market in the world, the Alsmere Market in Holland. Before this sale day ends, 14 million flowers and plants will have been sold. And this happens five days a week, every week of the year. During the night and early morning, flowers and plants are brought into the auction and placed on trailers. Inspectors examine each flower for quality and length. After each lot has been given a number, they're wheeled into one of five auction rooms where buyers will compete for the best prices. These are Dutch buyers, these are exporters, people who sell on the street and people who own a shop. The clock is the Dutch auction system and that means that it starts at 100, that it starts at high and it's going down. So the light is the price for one flower. You see how quick this yes, is going? Yes, the transactions are very fast. Is it like 20 seconds per transaction? Yeah, it's 20 so. seconds about the transactions. And we have about 40 until 50,000 transactions every morning. And that's, it starts here at 6.30 and it takes the, until 9.30. So this is only happening in about three, three and a half hours. And 80% is for export and that's half of it's uh, going to Germany, and at the moment 4% is going to America. While I was in Holland, I made a new friend, Wilma Miesman, a progressive florist with more than a dozen years experience. Wilma showed me an interesting way to arrange the signature flower of her home country, the tulip. It's no surprise that Holland is known around the world for its tulips. After all, they've been grown here for over 400 years. The Dutch are crazy about tulips, and the local florists never seem to tire of their beauty. They're constantly experimenting with new and creative ways to display them. Can you kind of describe to me what you're doing here? 
Yeah, I've uh, taken off all the foliage or all the leaves and I uh, bent them around in this phase. So each flower holds the next one yeah, in, right. in place and you just sort of weave them together. Yeah, right. Now I noticed you were scraping the stems. Yeah. You're doing that for what reason? Uh, so you can see the, the lines through the face, through the glass. Mm -hmm. And in this way uh, also the lines of the stems are very nice to see. And when I let the leaves on the stems, you can't see it this yes, through the face. So right. in this way, it's better to take it off. So decide. part of the design is being able to look through the vase and see all of those interesting shapes. Yes, right. It's beautiful. It's important to know for viewers that we only have used 15 stems in this vase. Then with only a few tulips, you can do a lot. Welcome to my studio. Here's where I take photographs that you send to me. We examine them, come up with ideas that hopefully will help you as you improve your landscapes. Today, we have a picture of a house from Marco in Memphis. Now just take a look at what he has here. Clearly, there's been some remodeling going on. I love the fresh coat of paint on the brick and the siding. Um, I think the shutters are pretty strong. You can see there's quite a bit of contrast there between the body of the house and the shutters. Now, if you're going to leave them that color, you need to realize that it's really sort of breaking the house up. The house will read larger if it's more monolithic or monochromatic. Um, by taking these shutters and painting them a shade or two, maybe even three darker than the body of the house could really make it nice and it would read much larger. Okay, with that said, I would also paint the door. It looks like you've used the color black here to accent these iron supports. I would think about painting the front door black. That would be really great looking. Now, the shrubs here look like that maybe they're pretty old. So these look like azaleas, and I would suggest that maybe we take these completely out. And I'd like for you to think about creating a color palette that's very simple. And with this house, with the window trim, the color of the house, if we went with an all-white theme, I think it could be a real knockout. So why don't we think about removing these azaleas and doing all white azaleas back here. I love the old GG Gerbing, which will do very well for you in Memphis. And then down here on this corner, let's do an old-fashioned Chinese snowball. I love that plant because it has big blooms on it the size of a softball. It looks like a hydrangea tree. And then in front of it, in front of this big bank of azaleas, why don't we come in with a mass planting of hydrangeas. The house is on the north side, so here's the perfect opportunity to drop in some white hydrangeas. You could use Annabelle's, staying with the white theme. If you wanted to shift to a cool color theme, you could use old Nico Blue, which is a wonderful old-fashioned hydrangea. Now behind here, and maybe a hedge running from there to the street would be in order, and you could use a Sasanqua camellia hedge. That's the fall blooming camellia, and it makes a wonderful hedge. I have one called Maiden's Blush, which has a very, very pale bloom on it, but a white flowering one is one called Snow on the Mountain. Now let's carry on with this theme. I think we need a big evergreen shrub here. We could have a Japanese Andromeda or the lily of the valley shrub here. And then your path, it looks like it's running very, very close here to the wall. I might kick that path out a little bit and give myself some space to grow maybe a dogwood tree right here on the corner or a Japanese maple. A Japanese maple would be gorgeous, particularly one like blood good with the red leaves. And then in this bed, I would fill that across the back with some fern and then a ground cover here. You could do something like English ivy or a juga. Bring the ferns all the way up along the edge to there. And then over here on this side, Marco, I would probably carve off a bit of this hillside like this. Let this be ground cover punctuated with maybe three boxwoods on the slope and then above it here maybe another dogwood tree white dogwood would be spectacular in full bloom there. And then that would give you some screening back to the back of your house where you have your garage. Just a few things for you to think about. Good luck with your project.
I've had the great privilege of designing gardens going on, oh well, <laughs> probably some 20 years now, and it's always interesting to revisit a garden that you designed for one homeowner who has since sold it to someone else. This was the case with Catherine Rogers' garden. Here you can see the Chippendale style gates I created, as well as an English arbor for the Rose Garden when I worked with the previous owners. I was pleased to see that Catherine has continued to enjoy this garden and has added her own personal touches. The lady that owned the house before was getting elderly and so it was really pretty covered in weeds. So that was probably my biggest task was just to come in and weed everything and bring it back to life. And then I've brought in a lot of my favorite plants. So I have some plants that I've carried with me from house to house. So we've really got two gardens. We have this one which I call my cottage garden. It's just a much more relaxed garden and it's where I do a lot of cutting uh, from the garden when I want a bouquet for the house. And then in the back, uh, we have the English garden with a fountain. And that's where we love to entertain our guest. In the English garden, one thing I did, in, in the winter it looked really kind of dead. So to keep it, at least to have some form in the winter, I uh, took little English boxwoods and lined all of the, the beds with that. But truly, the bones of this garden were great when I, I bought the house, and it's one of the reasons I did buy the house, is because I could see the potential of this space. Lots of color in the garden today. We have uh, phlox, and we have lots of lilies. Uh, this garden actually changes colors. If you come in the early spring, it's a very blue garden, and as we get a little bit closer into summer, a lot of the oranges and yellows start to come up. Um, I did add recently a lot of hybrid tea roses because I just love to cut them. So I've got about, oh, maybe eight varieties of new roses. This home is 40 years old, so the trees are very mature, uh, and that's another reason I bought the home. I love the mature oaks and the large magnolia that kind of anchors the far corner. Um, but, but it is a challenge. There's not a lot of sunlight, so it, you have to be very selective. I think seeing the variety of, of perennials that this garden has, it's almost exclusively perennials. So it really takes very little work. Um, other than deadheading and weeding, every year everything comes back pretty much on its own. I fill in a couple of spaces with annuals, but it's, it's really a perennial garden. It is the perfect size for one person to take care of. Um, I do have help with the lawn. My son comes over and mows it for me. But as far as the, the garden itself, um, it's a one-man show. My two best buddies in the garden and my constant companions while I'm out in the garden are my two dogs. I have uh, two Shih Tzus that are rescue dogs and they love being outside more than in the house. So they love it when I have a chance to come out and work in the garden. We've almost come to the end of the show, but before we close, I want to give you a very simple idea. It's a way to keep beautiful fresh flowers in your home during the winter. I love paper white narcissus. You can see them flowering over here. And what I like to do is simply take a tall cylinder like this and combine in the bottom these gorgeous river rock. You can get them at a hobby store in bags like this. And all you do is layer some of the rock into the bottom of the vase, as you can see here, and then drop the bulbs in. Paper white bulbs, by just adding water, will begin to produce roots and will grow up through the cylinder and flower, as you can see here. And by growing them in the cylinder, well, you don't have to stake them. And you have that marvelous aroma right up until the first daffodils begin to bloom in your own garden. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. Lots going on out here at the Garden Home Retreat, and I'm anxious to invite you inside for the latest construction update. I'll also show you how I'm taking the idea of the new old house and applying it to many of the features I'm installing, and learn how to keep rabbits and deer away from your produce and flowers. Looking forward to sharing some green ideas with you right here at the Garden Home Retreat. <music>